forwarded it to him too by Mr. I did, did so. You? Okay, good. All right, hopefully he's he's off your account. <laughs> All right. Okay. And I think you'll you'll see very quickly. Uh, welcome everybody, by the way, everybody who's joined us right now. It's sort of weird because we can't see you, but hopefully you can see us. And as we'll see, I think over the next minute or so, the number of attendees will rise steadily. Wow. Um, and we'll just give one more minute or so before we get, get started. There, I'm back. Hey, we all good? I think we are. I think we're just still waiting on uh, on Brenda, but I think we'll we'll get started in just a second here. Um, not sure why. Oh yeah, we this lost. We lost Brenda. All right, which, uh, okay. uh, everybody just uh, who's watching, just give us one second. We're just working on one technical thing on our end. We'll get started in just a second. Well, guys, I think uh, we're, we're just waiting on our last panelist, but I think we're going to get started just with uh, a little bit of our internal housekeeping, uh, and I'm sure that we will get her on in just a moment. But uh, to begin, I just want to welcome everyone. If I haven't had a chance to meet you in real life, I promise I am a real person. Uh, my name is Rabbi Dan Geffen. and I'm very honored to be the rabbi of Temple Adis Israel in Sag Harbor. Uh, and this evening, we are uh, really um, excited for uh, a very important event, one in which I expect there to be a, a tremendous amount of opportunity to learn and to connect and to engage. Uh, and in a moment, I will introduce our panelists uh, this evening who will help us in understanding and, and learning about the rich history uh, on our East End that perhaps many of us don't know nearly enough about. Uh, but before we get to our panelists, I just want to take a moment uh, to thank first and foremost, um, our social justice committee chairs, Alyssa Peake and Andrea Klausner, who you'll see on the screen right here. Uh, we at the Temple, when we began this, this program, uh, this was feels like a lifetime ago, but really only uh, more than a month ago. Uh, we'd originally en envisioned um, really just with our own community at the temple. And thankfully, that has uh, actually changed dramatically. And now we are welcoming uh, people tonight from many different communities and some people who are maybe not even in the area, uh, but who are here to learn. Uh, and really all of that happened because Alyssa and Andrea have taken a remarkable leadership position on our temple. Uh, and over the last few months in particular, done some uh, and very important work in the community. So I want to thank them both. And I want to just give a moment uh, for Alyssa and, and Andrea to, uh, to share a couple of words about the Social Justice Committee. And for those who may be interested, whether you're members of the temple or not, uh, in, to get involved in the work uh, that we will give them a few moments to, uh, to make their pitch. So uh, Alyssa, why don't you take over? Sure. So the Social Justice Committee started uh, August of 2019 after the tragedy at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. And we decided that we really need to know our community better and build bridges with those communities that we didn't know. Uh, we have four pillars that we work under, which is homelessness, uh, the feeding the hungry, children at risk, and immigration. And since COVID-19 in mid-March, we started feeding families through uh, OLA, Organization of Latina Americans. And on a weekly basis, we have um, volunteers who every week donate and deliver food, and we feed these families. And we're helping the Shinnecock Reservation, and we're helping um, the Black communities, and wherever we can um, in many different ways. And so we are still looking for volunteers for any of our programs that go throughout the year. So if you're looking to, if you want to do something in this time, and you don't know where to start, or you don't know where to go, just give us a call, email us, and we can give you an assignment of what to do and help us out. Okay. 
Lisa, thank That's you. Annie, anything to add? Yeah, I just wanted to add that um, in general, we see ourselves as a clearinghouse. We, we don't want to duplicate efforts. There are so many wonderful organizations doing great work on the East End already with social justice and civil rights and, and charitable work. And so our philosophy, you know, we do some programs that we initiate, but our philosophy is to reach out to other segments of the larger community and to say, what can we do to help? What do you need from us rather than we deciding what projects should take place? So in that way, we hope to build community and to work together. And the best way to promote any group civil rights is to promote every group's civil rights. And we hope to work together and collaborate together. Right. Well, Andy and Alyssa, thank you so much. I'm going to uh, move you back to the attendee space. Uh, so please don't think me rude. Uh, just give me one second to do that. Okay. Um, and uh, just as a last word, which is that you may notice that I, I uh, like our presenters, I'm at home. So if you may hear a screaming child or see a potentially half naked screaming child run behind me at some point, you'll forgive me. But she's wonderful. <laughs> just don't have so much control over. So thank you again uh, for being here this evening. I want to introduce our panelists this evening. And I know that we are, are waiting still on one of them who we hope will be able to uh, get in, but I figure at the least let me begin the introduction. Uh, so as I do, and perhaps I don't know if everybody can see everybody's name is listed on the Zoom, but if you can just raise a hand as I call on you. Uh, so first I want to introduce Donna Marie Barnes, who is the Executive Director of Sylvester Manor on Shelter Island. She has spent over, uh, oh sorry. Actually I'm just, I'm the curator, not the Executive Director. Oh I'm so sorry. That's okay. Look, that is not something to be, right? That is, a, that is an amazing thing and one that requires a tremendous amount of effort and work. <laughs> but my apologies. Curator uh, of Sylvester Manor on Shelter Island. She has spent over 30 years working in the editorial photography field as a photo editor for publications such as People Magazine and Essence, and as a photo librarian and editor at the Gamma Liaison Photo Agency. She is a lifelong summer and full-time resident of Sag Harbor. She curated a highly acclaimed historic tintype photography exhibition in 2015 at the Eastville Community Historical Society. Donna Marie came to Sylvester Manor in 2014 as a volunteer and as a history docent and is now working to archive the various collections within the Manor House as well as lead tours for individuals and groups. And uh, when we get to in a few moments, I think Donna Marie can tell us a little bit more about Sylvester Manor as I imagine maybe some of us don't don't know as much as we ought to. And by the end of tonight, I hope we will know quite a lot more. So we welcome you, Donna Marie. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Um, Dr. Georgette Greer-Key, uh, wave to Dr. Georgette over there, uh, is, is the Executive Director of the Eastville Community Historical Society uh, and the inaugural Executive Director and Chief Curator of the Eastville Community Historical Society of Sag Harbor, New York, and is the President of the Association of Suffolk County Historical Societies and cultural partner for Sylvester Manor of Shelter Island. She is one of the most outspoken advocates for the preservation and celebration of Long Island history with an emphasis on African American, Native American, and mixed heritage historical reconstruction. Dr. Greer Key is a full-time history and political science professor at SUNY Nassau Community College, where she created the new grant-funded History Institute and Local History Initiative. Most recently, she was elected to the 2019 class of Board of Trustees for the Preservation League of New York State and the 2020 class of the Board of Directors of the Museum Association of New York. Dr. Greer Key contributes commentary regularly to local media outlets on Long Island, including Newsday, Sag Harbor Express, CBS New York, and News 12. Her research has been published in the Long Island History Journal and the Suffolk County Historical Society Register. We welcome you, Dr. Georgette Greer Key. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you so much for having me. And I too, like Donna Marie, I need to update my resume, sadly. <laughs> Look, I will just say this as a, as a matter of fact for all of you. Uh, it, I think actually everyone should see the resume in its entirety. And if I edited anything incorrectly, I apologize. That is entirely- No, it's not you. It's not you. It's just sometimes, you know, you're just so busy and you're like, okay, uh, there's been some changes. I'm like no longer at, you know, full time at NASA. Um, so that's one of the only change that is, yeah. I, I understand. I appreciate, again, the, the importance of being exact. So, you know, you got to call me on these things for sure. And I will tell you my experience as well. 
I think at a certain point I had it updated by bio to reference my daughter. So, you know, we, we've all got uh, moments where we learn from these things. So Dr. Georgia, thank you so much for being here. And, uh, and our panelists in the top left, at least on my window, uh, David Ratray is uh, one who I'm sure is very well known to many of you on our call tonight. Uh, he is the editor of East Hampton Star. And David, you'll correct me if anything is wrong in my account either. And uh, I should just tell you, you should look at some point or another uh, to the bio that I found on the Guildhall website. It lists some of your, your previous uh, positions before being editor, which are amazing. Uh, go look at it and enjoy. But let's just say that, that he is, uh, has enjoyed a well-rounded experience in life and worked in many different instances in many different places. But we are very lucky that he is the fifth member of the Rat Ray family over three generations to have taken on the role of editor of East Hampton Star succeeding his mother, Helen, in 2003. He joins us tonight having worked together with our other panelists on the Plain Sight Project, which we will hear about more this evening as we continue. So I welcome all of our panelists, and of course we are gonna to continue to work to get Brenda on, and when she gets on, we will introduce her as well. Uh, and at this point, uh, perhaps Donna Marie, maybe you can start us off. We we're hoping to get a little bit of, of background um, about the sort of cultural history, the history of your organization, Sylvester Manor, uh, primarily, and how ultimately speaking uh, that you and your work and Sylvester Manor as a whole have uh, both preserved and remembered in our okay. community and done that work. Okay. Um, so for those of you who don't know, and um, before I made a visit to Shelter Island and read a book called The Manor, I didn't know. Sylvester Manor um, was the first settlement on Shelter Island. It was established in 1651 by uh, a group uh, headed by Nathaniel Sylvester, who was an Englishman uh, who had grown up in the Netherlands. And he, his brother, and two partners uh, owned sugarcane plantations on the island of Barbados. Uh, and this is during the mid 1600s. And the work there uh, was done by enslaved Africans. Um, sugar had become the greatest ca cash crop in the world when it was introduced to Europe, and so they were making money hand over fist. Uh, because uh, Barbados was so fertile for sugarcane to grow, they neglected to grow food um, or other provisions to help with the survival of their workforce. And so literally they were working and starving enslaved African people to death. So the partners knew that they needed to import what they needed from somewhere else. And so they decided to buy an alternate location that was situated within their triangle trade of the West Indies uh, in, up to the North American colonies and then back to Europe. And they settled on Sh Shelter Island, which they purchased for 1,600 pounds of Muscovado sugar from an Englishman named uh, Stephen Goodyear, who was an executive uh, in the Connecticut colony. Uh, Nathaniel, being the youngest, was the one that was going to establish the settlement there. And he arrived uh, to find uh, Native people, the Manhansets, uh, people who had made Shelter Island their home for thousands of years. Uh, the Manhansets had had enough exposure to Europeans to know that they had some rights. And so they took the partners to court in Connecticut uh, because uh, Long Island was still then a part of the New England settlement. And they sued them and they won. And in 1653, they, uh, they won their suit and the partners were forced to rebuy the island from the Manhansets, this time for 800 pounds of Muscovado sugar. Um, when I give tours, I like to say it was the greatest Hamptons real estate deal in history. Um, and so the Sylvester family, uh, Nathaniel specifically through the years, bought out the remaining partners. He owned uh, the entire island, the 8,000 acres of Sylvester, Man of, Sylvester, of Sylvester Manor, of Shelter Island, excuse me. And that, that property descended uh, through only one generation intact before his son started to sell off the land, um, but has descended through the family for 12 generations. And in 2009, it passed to uh, Evan Fisk Ospie and his nephew, Bennett Kinesny, who made the decision after their uncle, Andrew Fisk, had passed away, he was the last full-time resident, to create a not-for-profit organization called Sylvester Manor Educational Farm and dedicate this farm to uh, 
honoring the history and the stories of all the people of Sylvester Manor and to establish a new organic farm. And so for the past 10 years, that's how we've operated. And today we are 241 acres of land. We have a very prosperous farm and farm stand, which I encourage all of you to visit. Uh, we have a 1735 manor house that was built by Nathaniel's grandson, Brinley Sylvester, um, that's unfortunately closed for the season due to the virus. And uh, we have beautiful grounds and it's my job to tell the stories. I tell the stories of all of the people of the family who, who came there and settled there, of the enslaved people they brought with them, uh, of uncovering new facts and identities for them, and of the native people um, who made it their home for, for thousands of years. Sorry, thank you. And, and maybe I could just add something which I'll add to, to the rest is at the moment, given what's going on, uh, what accessibility is there for Sylvester Manor? How can we still connect with you even sure. in time of pandemic? So because the manor house is closed, I'm not giving tours of the house, uh, but the grounds are open. We have trails, we have gardens, uh, we have obviously the farm and the windmill to come and visit. And we've, uh, you know, we've had to completely change how we tell the story and use other means. And so there are, there is a walking tour app that you can, that you can download from uh, the Apple Store, um, which is a guided history tour throughout the grounds. There are maps with, with different information. I'm sometimes there just to answer questions. Um, our website has been expanded, so there's lots of things you can learn there. We have a very active social media presence, uh, not only for just uh, announcements of things going on at the farm or um, programming, but also history lessons. So we're trying very hard in this time to be innovative and creative and find new ways to bring our story to life. Um, there are always new things to discover. Um, if I look, I can find something usually every day that's, that's new and exciting. And, and so right now we're just trying to really implement ways to, to get the word out. Um, this, this panel is one of the ways um, to just tell our story. And so we do encourage everybody to come and visit us on Shelter Island at Sylvester Manor Educational Farm. Fantastic. And uh, I, I know I will be lined up as soon as we can get back there. <laughs> it really will be there. But the app is very cool. That's really yes. awesome. But yeah. okay, well, let's talk about that uh, another time separately. But really, Don Marie, thank you for starting us off in such a You're great very way. Welcome. And uh, we'll get to know more about you and more about your work uh, as we continue on with the evening. And if I can ask one favor of you, Don Marie, maybe you can help take over. I know Dr. Uh, Gerke was trying to get uh, Brenda in. Maybe we can shift and see if you can help her out a, a little bit on that and we'll, we'll keep working. And uh, Dr. Georgette Greer Key, if we can uh, turn to you and, and learn a little bit also uh, about your work and about, uh, as we said, the cultural history first of the organization that you are uh, representing tonight and also about the work that you do day in and day out and that has been done uh, in the historical society. And maybe even to tell us a little bit about perhaps the, how you became the inaugural uh, executive director and what that process was like. Oh, that's a lot. Okay, um, we'll take it a step at a time. Rabbis ask big questions. <laughs> you know, it's fine. Um, it's kind of, um, well, so I can go in order. Um, well, Eastville Community Historical Society um, was started um, in the 80s um, when um, Kathy Tucker, um, she actually, her mother was a member of St. David AME Zion and um, she was concerned with the condition of the church and the, um, the fact that the membership was actually dwindling down and the church was in disrepair. So that was the forming of the actual historical society and her mother was living um, in uh, Sac Harbor full time. So she says, we got to come together. We have to do something about the church itself. So that's how the actual society had formed at, around the St. David AME Zion Church. Um, so that's how the historical society, but the community itself, the first time we actually see it um, forming is uh, in 1830, we see the first time that it's placed on a census. Um, but the community um, has a very um, important history 
um, which is also connected to Sylvester Manor um, with Hempstead, David Hempstead. So that's our connection to Sylvester Manor. Um, so Donna Marie will go into that a little bit later. Um, but to us, it's a really important co community and the collection that we really talk a lot about is the collective identity, which we have currently uh, another iteration um, of an exhibition that's going on currently right now, um, where we have our tagline of linking three cultures. So you open, Brenda. Sorry, Beth, I really <laughs> apologize. I so apologize. You have nothing to apologize about, Brenda. The only person that has to apologize is the right guy running the tech. So I'm going to tell that rabbi he needs to work on his, on his stuff. <laughs> we are happy to have you here. And, and we'll let Dr. Greer here finish where, where she was going, and then I'll introduce you and we'll ask you the question. Okay, you're perfect time. All right, thank you. So um, when we say linking three um, cultures, we really talk about the Native American, uh, the African American, um, and the European immigrants that um, we talk about coming together to create a sense of community where they work together, they worship together, and in turn together. Um, and we see this throughout um, the church, uh, the cemetery, and living together. Um, and many of um, the records that we have, we see that throughout, um, through Liberty Street, through Eastville Avenue, um, through Hempstead. So it just, it just resonates throughout the whole community. Mm -hmm. We see patterns, different patterns of uh, women, uh, matriotic leading the women, the whaling, um, the different lifestyles that we see there. And it's so important to us to have these different thematics that we can pull upon um, which is really great um, when you think about the importance of that connection and what we're actually experiencing today. It's one of the ones that we can look to as an example. Mm. Um, so the research that we're currently doing now is looking at the records in relation to the cemetery as well. That's a lot of work that we've been doing. Mm. Some of the family names that you see, um, they go from anywhere to Southhold, um, to Southampton, like names like Halsey, like Young, um, the Young. So there's so many names and connections throughout um, Long Island as itself um, that are really important and the connections of these different families and family trees. Um, so it's really important. One of the things, the questions that I get asked a lot is about the Underground Railroad. Mm. Um, one of the early uh, research projects, and we had the state come down and talking about the Underground Railroad. There is nothing that is a monolith. Um, the Underground Railroad does not have to look the same. Yes, all of the, many of the houses on Liberty Street, they have uh, these underground compartments, but that doesn't mean that there was a possibility that there were enslaved people hidden there. They could have been root sellers. Mm -hmm. They could have been a place where they just hid value, you know, valuable things or whatever it was. But we do believe that there was a possibility that there was a underground railroad, but it didn't look like what we normally see. Mm -hmm. We believe that there was such a relationship with the Native Americans that were run out of Montauk, and but they were excellent hunters and uh, they knew the waterways and that the, if there was any way of escape, they used those actual uh, routes, the water routes and or the hunting trails because there were many um, Native Americans that were experts in that field, and mm. that's what they would have used to have escaped. And when the state came down, what they did is they acknowledged that there was some activity that we could not specifically prove. And if you come to Eastville, there was a bus stop there. Mm. Next to that bus stop, you will see that there is, um, it looks like there is where you would tie up the actual horses, a monument there that the state placed there in recognition that mm. there is some activity that could not be proved, but they put that there as um, acknowledgement of the activity of um, some activity mm. in regards to slavery. So that's one of the histories that we have there. Um, when you go fast forward into the 1940s, we have the other history of um, black leisure where African-Americans owned second homes um, and they wanted to have access to the water and leisure living, um, which is the SANS communities that we recently worked on getting um, designation. Um, so that's another part of the history. So we have such a layered history that's a continuum and we're still creating history today. Um, so we have many different histories 
um, that um, we're collecting and we're still collecting. We mm. have um, a part of the permanent place in the National Museum in Washington. We have um, part of our collection in the National Museum in Washington as well. So we have a lot of history that we are willing to share and we welcome you to come down. Part of our mission also too is preservation. Mm. Um, that is a big part of uh, our history. And that means we are actively seeking to make sure that our presence is available in the built environment, not just in documents, not just in photographs. We are actively concerned with making sure that we have a presence in the built environment. Mm. You know the saying, out of sight, out of mind. Um, when you think about Long Island as a whole and design, they talk about how Long Island was built to basically hide pockets of po uh, poverty, hide pockets of different things. We want to make sure that that doesn't happen. Mm. Um, and no matter how many times people come to us, they say, we didn't know, we didn't see, you know, so that came that whole thing of hitting in plain sight or not being seen. So those are the type of things that we want to ensure doesn't happen. So the history of African Americans in Long Island and for the country for that matter, it's been there. It's just not documented in the same way. And so we want to make sure that it is documented, that it is a part of the teaching mechanism. Um, so that's what we've been trying to do is to bring it to the forefront. Mm. Um, so our records is something that we've been working on to have digitized. Um, okay. And as far as our collection, you know, we have a large collection of photography from uh, tintypes to carta vistas to um, other parts of photography that Donna Marie has been working with us to digitize to manuscripts to rare books. Uh, Laura Tucker, I think she may be um, one of the you know, a, a viewer. So a lot of literature and different books that is where we have a lot of vinyl records. So different mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and we hope to um, be a listening, uh, have a listening room, have a library. Um, so that's the kind of work that we've been doing. So from the Black Whalers, talking about Piers Thompson having his records, having tax maps. Um, so those are the things that we've been working on. And as far as my other work, we've worked on a lot of um, houses. We worked with East Hampton Town to work on uh, the Fowler House in Freetown. Uh, we work with um, Southampton Village and Southampton Town to preserve the Pierce Concer um, Homestead, the home lot 51 Pond Street, mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and the Sands community. So we actively work on preservation. As far as my larger role, I serve on the Museum Association Board of New York State and also the Preservation League of New York State, which I see working hand in hand mm -hmm. so that we have a connection with the state to make sure that these services do serve Long Island because you know it's like night and day. Um, and I do think an important part of all of the work that we do collectively, if there's one person that I would have to shout out, it would definitely be Fred Thiel. Mm. Because Fred Thiel understands that the land use laws that aid all of the work that we need to do is important because preservation is important, but also it is the conservation of our land that is most important because that's been the biggest fight is the land, mm. you know, the westward expansion, et cetera, et cetera, is really what's important. So. Um, when we brought Joseph McGill to Long Island a long time ago, we talked about that. When we brought Andrew Carl to Long Island, we talked about the relationship with African Americans and minority in regards to land. So it starts there first. Mm. And then we talked about the improved land. That's another story. Mm. And having documentation of that land is another story. And so all the other things that come along with it the images, the records, that's a different layer. So we build upon layer upon layer, and sometimes the record goes cold. We may have a first name, we may have a last name, we may have an image or not. There may be a, a description, a meets or bounds. So all of that stuff, bringing it together, sometimes we can create a story, sometimes we can't. Sometimes there's a marker, sometimes it's not. So trying to fit within a traditional framework is sometimes hard 
but respecting all of it, the traditional framework, the oral story, you know, conventional wisdom. How do we do all of that to tell the collective story responsibly, but respecting tradition of other people's way of honoring history? Mm. So that's really the work that I seek to do. Fantastic. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Drew. And, and just one quick other addition, you know, having lived around the corner for a number of years and realizing that summertime, especially uh, how this historical society is, is really a center, uh, a, a gathering place, knowing that it must be very hard this summer, that some of that is not possible. But is there anything, uh, you know, coming up or anything that we can be aware of in, in terms of a way of engaging during, during COVID times uh, that we can, can make sure we stay connected and learning? Absolutely. And um, you missed the fish fry this weekend. I know. Um, I know. <laughs> my, my arteries are probably thanking me for missing it, but the rest of me is really upset. <laughs> yes. The fish fry, uh, we just got our permits like on uh, July 22nd and the fish fry was the 25th. So it was cutting it really short. Um, so, but um, if anyone's listening and you weren't able to participate, we're still accepting donations. Just a shameless plug. No, that um, is not a shameless you, plug. That's <laughs> actually an important plug. All of you should say that tonight in one form or the other, please. It's very important. And, but we still do have our exhibition up um, and we do um, have it up at our cemetery. So you're welcome to do a drive by and see our exhibition. We do have part of it up on our building as well. Um, just like Donna Marie, we do have a walking app. Um, so if you go to our building, we have um, a code that you can scan with your phone and it will come up for Android or for iPhone. And at the cemetery, you can also scan it. Then you can, or can go onto our website or the Sag Harbor Partnership and scan the code too to get our walking app. So we do plan on doing some programming and there are rules that everybody is confused about. So per phase four um, rules of New York State, programming is a specific rule that um, you have to cut your programming by 33%. Um, and if you are doing a social event, it's 50, um, 50 people socially. And so we did obey by the rules because there is such a thing as event shaming now these days. I don't know if you knew about that. I had Good to, to learn all about that this weekend. Yes. So people are being event shamed. Um, okay. So I had to learn about that. Okay. So, um, but we're trying, to, we're trying to accommodate everybody. So if you don't want to be event shamed, we prepared a drive-by for you. So our cemetery is on Eastville Avenue. You can drive by by yourself. I did. Thank you. I love it. I love being as, as considerate and thoughtful as possible for the widest range. I love it. I absolutely love it. Dr. Dorjet, thank you for that introduction. And uh, Brenda, we're going to turn to you in a second. I just want to give you your, your introduction since we didn't get to it at first. Uh, so Brenda Simmons is the executive director of the Southampton African American Museum. She was raised in Southampton, New York, and earned her bachelor's degree in community service with a concentration in advocacy from SUNY Empire State University. She received the Chancellor's Award for Student Excellence and was subsequently hired as Family Development Worker slash Director for the Economic Opportunity Council of Suffolk County, working to empower single moms while at the same time obtaining her family credentials from Cornell University. In 2005, she was hired as the assistant to the mayor in the village of Southampton for Mayor Mark Epley and was also the recording secretary for the Board of Trustees, serving in that capacity for 11 years. Also in that same year, Brenda became co-founder of the African American Museum of the East End. Brenda is also the producer host of her own TV show on LTV in Wayne Scott, New York, called VOW Voices of Wisdom, which explores relationships, I love that by the way, and topics that are educational, informative, and sometimes even controversial. Brenda spends her winters in the beautiful Caribbean where she enjoys painting, photography, writing poetry, and working on several books. And I had to include this friend because I love it. She is a vibrant, strong, independent woman who loves life, and she herself is love itself. And in my limited experience already with you, Brenda, I would say that that is a very accurate rendition. And we are very, very happy to have you with us tonight. And where we're just beginning at, at the outset is to just tell us a little bit about your organization, about the uh, museum, and uh, also at, at the, uh, the end of it, sort of um, you know, how the museum itself thinks about the question of, of both the preservation and the remembrance aspects in our community. Uh, and if you wouldn't mind just giving us a little bit of a taste of that and then we will, we will go to David and then open up from there. 
Thank you again for inviting me uh, to be a panelist. And again, I apologize again for getting on late. No but, problem. Um, our organization is the Southampton African American Museum and is located at 245 North Sea Road in Southampton. The building was originally a juke joint, a barber shop, and a beautician, a beauty parlor back in the 40s. And it was a gathering place. I heard you mention um, earlier about a gathering place. Mm -hmm. That also was a gathering place for back in the 40s, of course, for the African Americans to gather where they had a, a safe haven to you know let the hair down and you know relax and also it was very very important to share uh, political issues the importance of voting and as well as um, the importance of education and um, pa fast forward um, the building had been sitting for a while and we um, as a system to the mayor I got a wonderful letter that came across his desk to demolish the building and so I stepped into the mayor's office and politely said, I will be the crazy woman standing in front of the bulldozer because this is not going to happen. And then I proceeded to just kindly told, tell him a little history. My auntie used to be the beautician there as well. So when I was like maybe I think 12 or 13, I used to go in and answer the phones for her and write appointments down and do little coffee runs for her. So it was very personal to me. So moving forward is the first African-American site in the village of Southampton to be historically designated. So moving forward again, um, basically the museum now is going to be um, a three themes and Georgette has been working very closely with me and I, I appreciate her muchly. And the three themes that we're going to um, have at the museum is going to be the great migration, mm -hmm. the history of barbershops and beauty parlors, as well as the Pierce concert, um, project. So those are the three themes that um, we're going to be having. And I think people understand the importance of the barbershops during that time, because that was probably the only black entrepreneurships that they had during that time. So that was really a you know lucrative business for blacks during that time. Mm -hmm. So and like I said, also the importance of as, as being a gathering place. Um, what else am I supposed to say now? <laughs> No, already it's a good starting point for because we're going to get in deeper into the history. Um, and um, it, it, I guess maybe what I would say uh, is sort of um, philosophically, right? Another, how do you think about history at the museum? You know, why why do you see uh, it essential that there be an African American museum in Southampton, uh, and and how do you best go about teaching that that history? Well, it's interesting just to say that it's in Southampton. <laughs> Just to say is in the Hamptons is very important mm -hmm. because, you know, mm -hmm. for the most part, most people don't even, you know, for my experience, you know, I, born, I was born and raised in Southampton. And for the most part, um, during my travels, when I tell people I was from Southampton, they kind of gave me one of those looks at times, you know, and it's been several times where, you know, it hasn't been, you know, known that I think more so now it's better. But during a, lot, a long time, when this began to start with the museum, and the reason why I really started was the fact that it wasn't known that we had an important legacy in the, in the village of Southampton. And besides the fact, I have my two children, and I had to actually take my children into the city to give them any kind of cultural experience. So I also thought when this came up with the museum, I thought this was a, be a, a, a wonderful uh, aspect to do to, you know, not only for my children, but for the community and not mm. just for the black community. And I want to emphasize that as well. Mm. And, you know, it's so it's important to have that preservation in the village of Southampton. And like I said, the, the one thing that I think is really wonderful, um, we have, I guess now at one point, it was for 10 years, we were collaborating with the local school district. Mm. And doing that, we would have, I reached out at the beginning, I reached out to the art teachers and it was during Black History Month, and they would come together and they would draw some drawings having to do with famous African-American poets or artists or inventors. And then we would actually have an art display in the vestibule of Village Hall. So mm. that went on for a while. And then after a while, you know, things were changing. And I connected with two wonderful elementary school teachers. Mm. And this is the story I like to share, and I'm not going to make it long, but, you know, the two teachers were so involved in what I want to do. 
And one of them was Dr. Uh, Leticia Ellis. I want to shout her out. And we would, they would, the, the, her and uh, Mrs. Ellis, Mrs. Ellis and Mrs. Tubeck was their names. Um, they would actually have the, te have the kids. They were third and fourth graders, mind you. They would work with them months before the display and they would either draw or do an essay about an African-American uh, politician or a writer or a basketball player or an inventor, et cetera. And then I think probably at a week later, we would come and we would do the art, art, uh, the art display in the village hall, in the vestibule, and they would have a field day. Mm -hmm. And the field day would consist of the kids coming over and their parents would meet them. And they would, we would, we would view the, um, you know, the uh, exhibit and they would acknowledge and we would have like a little opening, uh, you know, gallery opening. And then the cute part was we would actually go down to the boardroom. And this is the part the kids really loved because they got to meet the mayor. But they actually would sit, they would sit on the DS with where the, where the mayor and the trustees would sit. They would literally sit there. So then I would introduce the mayor. The mayor would have some wonderful dialogue with the children. And then they would proceed with the program a wonderful program. And as years progressed, I did this probably for almost 10 years. And as the last few years, it was amazing to me because these children actually did the whole program themselves. It was the highlight of my job, to be very honest. But the other thing that I really enjoyed too, that um, the parents had to get involved with doing research with their children with Black history. So it was kind of a double thing, you know? So it was, a, you know, it was a great to, for that to happen. And also, um, I think Georgette mentioned, mentioned about my involvement with Pierce Conser. Um, the Southampton Historical Museum reached out to me with their educational program to see if they could do something with the school regarding Pierce Conser. So I did this wonderful idea. I said, I'll dress up like Rachel, Pierce Conser's mm -hmm. wife. And what I did was I dressed up as Rachel's, Pierce Conser's wife, and the children would come over and I would talk to them about my husband. Mm. So it was really, 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 really a good thing. And then the last thing I'll mention is um, I also went to the school district in Southampton and I mentioned um, that they should definitely add Pierce Concert to their local history. The local, and so they're in the process of doing it as we speak. Mm. So, you know, it's about upfront and personal. It's about really, um, and I think the great thing about it is getting to the young people, you know, and getting them educated. And mm -hmm. I think that's really critical and really um going to be a really profound thing to happen for the past on. But like I said, I also enjoyed that the parents had to be, um, had to be, you know, also um, involved. I, I love it. I, I especially love, again, the attention to, to the next generation, to getting into the schools, to making sure that stories are told and that there are individual stories, local stories, people that we can connect with. And Brenda, especially the, the experiential learning, right? The, the role play, the dressing up as, Yes. At least in my experience, it can be really quite profound for everybody involved, including for those who are in the role, right? Trying to imagine our mindset and in, in trying to be in that space and that time and what's going on. Yes, uh, yes. You know, I, I may in, in implore uh, you at some point in the future, if you might be willing to redo it again for maybe some of our students in the Hebrew school, oh, that absolutely. would be really wonderful. Absolutely. But I won't, I won't ask any more of you tonight that I've already asked of you. But, uh, but I, I'll just say, too, I'm a frustrated actress, so that's a, that would be really, <laughs> I, I love <laughs> Aren't we all in some form or the other, you know? Uh, no, but Brenda, thank you. And just very quickly, before we go to David and we start to talk a little bit um, about the history and about Queen's site project, uh, could you just tell us a little bit in terms of what is accessible at the moment uh, during COVID times with the, the museum? This, you, you asked me this question? Well, unfortunately, yeah. I wasn't going to go there, but I will. Unfortunately, the museum has been in a process of being renovated. And this process has been a little while and a little challenge. But moving forward in a positive way, um, the last contractor we had wasn't well. I mean, wasn't that well. He didn't do a good job. I'm, I'm trying to be good. I'm trying to no, be good. I understand. I understand. We won't put so, you in any compromised position. So, but. so we had to um, dismiss him. And so they had to go through the whole uh, process again. bid yeah. process all over again. So they finally got a, um, a new contractor. He got Kobe. So he had to stop. Then they had the phases going on. So now they're in the process of finally going forward and renovating the building. And I was told that the timeline of completion should be um, three to four months. But prior to that, as you know, for all these years, we've been working as a virtual museum. Well, I think that's, that's fantastic to continue that work. And I hope that we will all be there to celebrate when the doors open and be able to come in 
Uh, Brenda, really, thank you so much. And I think that just picking up on a, a number of things that have already been said and bringing David into the conversation, because I know your connection, David, uh, I think to all of our panelists is through the um, uh, Plain Sight project. And I think that actually it was really interesting that each of you mentioned, and especially Dr. Georgette, as you were pointing out the, the importance of the physical space, right? The land, the stories that are often associated with that land and the tendency, the very real tendency uh, of others to plow over, so to speak, those histories, if not preserved. Uh, and so I would really love to hear just maybe, David, you can you can jump in here and everybody can jump in and telling us a little bit about the, the Plain Sight Project and perhaps also starting to get into a little bit of the, the historical narrative, you know, try to, to help those of us who are definitely in the need to learn more about really what is the history of, of the communities uh, out here? When does it date from and, and how can we make sure that we are not missing the things that are in Plain Sight that we should really be seeing? Um, <clears throat> well, the Plain Sight Project is at its simplest an effort to understand um, who lived here, what did they do, and a little bit about where they went. And it really started in ignorance. I knew essentially nothing about uh, slavery on the East End. And I didn't even know how long it lasted. But we're talking about a period of time that is roughly 180 years during which slavery was part of the fabric of the East End. And it's actually really neat to have Donna Marie and Georgette and Brenda, they're not only sort of the brain trust uh, behind the Plainsight Project and really been with us since the very beginning. Um, one of our first meetings was, was in the Eastville um, community house and um, it was a cold day and we all huddled there to sort of talk about it. And it was really a sharing of understanding um, an economic picture during the colonial period and the early um, American Republic that ties together all those communities of Shelter Island and East Hampton and South Hold and South Hampton. Um, and, and also demonstrates that, that slavery here really was the norm. It wasn't exceptional. Uh, it, it, it was part and parcel of the economic picture and, and the, the um, development of the communities here in, in the, the colonial period. And what we do is essentially crowdsource research. And the reason we call it plain sight is that enslaved people, both uh, Native American and of African heritage, are not really hidden at all. And there's a wealth of documentation where you can find their names. And so we've had high school students, we've had, um, there's a couple of, uh, parents that have gotten involved. And basically it's pouring over old records. Some are easy to find like censuses. Some are very difficult to deal with like commercial uh, log account books and things like that to try and identify every single enslaved person that lived first in East Hampton and then on the East End of Long Island from the beginning until it faded away slowly in the 1830s. There's an amazing span of time. In East Hampton alone, we started with two people we knew of, Ned and Peggy. Now we have over 300 names or what we call confirmed identities on our list. We're moving into Southampton. We have a group forming in Southhold now to do the same thing, really tear apart the old records. And, you know, in a nutshell, be able to say something about an, every single enslaved person that ever lived here whether it's just a date. Um, you know, I think, I, it, it, I know that for, for Donna Marie and, and Georgette and Brenda and I, it just, just to be able to say one thing about one person who is enslaved here is, um, I, you know, I, I find it very moving. Um, we're also moving into schools. We had a 10th grader this spring who made a um, pandemic perfect five minute animated video to take to seventh graders when they start learning about American history. And the point of the video is really simple. It's basically to say slavery existed here. It's not a Southern thing, it's an American thing, and we can show you how. And that's kind of a nutshell what we're all about. Well, that's, uh, it's really incredible. And I, you know, I think obviously, um, you know, I, I'm coming into this conversation from a, a certain angle and I'm thinking about, you know, sort of um, both Jewish history and, and specifically the requirement of, of forceful remembrance. In other words, we are commanded various times in the Bible, you have to remember, right? Don't, and, and it will say, don't forget, and also make sure that you actively remember. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've always taken that uh, as to be one of the central and most important commandments that exists 
you know, are actually our shared traditions, right? These are traditions that exist in all the sister faiths. And in particular, I think, as you're talking about the importance of identifying and giving a reality to individuals, even if you only have a number, right? Even if you only have a date, that work is, I, I have no other word for it, but other to say that it is sacred work. So I thank all of you, certainly just, just principally, before we even go any further into the conversation, thank you for doing this work, because we all know it wouldn't happen otherwise. And it sure is hard. Anybody that has dealt with any kind of work dating back any period of time, let alone having to read people's handwriting will know this is, this is really, this is, has to be a work of passion and of love. Uh, and I think that ultimately speaking, as all of you have already talked about, this is love to be shared, right? This is something for all of us, you know, interlopers who've only moved in the last, you know, 10 years to people who have lived here for generations. There is so much to learn and so much to know, and the dignity that you are giving posthumously to those whose dignity in many cases was taken away forcibly, I think is an incredible gift, if I can lack of a better term, but something to give uh, to the memory of those whose lives were, were taken away and were affected in such horrible way. And I think equally important is to remind us that our, our convenient image that these things always happen, the, the bad stuff always happens away. It's somebody else that had to do with it. It didn't happen in my backyard. It's not my family. The reality is it's all, it's in our fabric. It is in our narrative. And anybody who comes to live in this area must understand that that is part of the story. Um, so I think, you know, we've given sort of as a, as a beginning point, it might be helpful and maybe all four of you can, can help us to paint a little bit of a, of a timeline and a narrative as best as you can to give us a little bit more of a fuller sense of, of what, what is the history of, of in particular, the, the black communities on the East End and those who were enslaved and brought over here? Do we have any sense of, uh, in the beginnings, where they were coming from? Do we have any details that you've unearthed in the project that would help to paint a, a fuller picture uh, rather than one that is perhaps caricatured or limited in, uh, in some capacity? Um, I'll go first. Um, okay. Well, as I said, Sylvester Manor, um, was the first settlement of, of Shelter Island. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as we know, the enslaved people who came in 1651 were brought from the Caribbean, specifically from Barbados. Mm. There was a connection between Northern slavery and the Caribbean because of the sugar industry and other mm. uh, establishments that provisioned uh, the plantations in the West Indies. Um, I think one of the points I wanted to make in giving what everybody has said is that this is our community and this is the history of our community. This is not black history. This is American history. Mm. And mm. What we're, the work that we're all doing um, and specifically what we're doing in the plain sight is to uh, resurrect those people who have been left out of the history. Um, this is a, an amazing community. And this is where the United States began in many ways. And until we tell all of the stories of all of the people, then we really are uh, at a disadvantage um, because it wasn't just uh, the hardworking settlers who settled this land. It was uh, always a community of three ethnicities. Uh, the Europeans who came to settle, the, the Africans who were enslaved to work the land and build the buildings um, that we all deem as being historic, and the Native people who made this their ancestral home. Mm. So until we really understand how those three cultures interconnected from the very beginning, we cannot separate them, um, then we can't really figure out how to move forward together. Mm. And so it's very, you know, the work that we uncover, and, and we are, the, th the three of us, very passionate about it. And mm -hmm. in that meeting that we had in that Kolb's Heritage House, the first time David came to talk about the Plainside Project, Georgette, Brenda, and I were a puddle of tears. <laughs> because it's, these revelations are just there, it may just simply be a name on a page next to you know, an uh, indication that that person was given shoes. And all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, th they're real. We're mm -hmm. giving them lives. Um, in many ways, you can say the three of us and others, we've been called to do this work, to uncover these lives and to say their names. And, to sh <laughs> and you couldn't have three better storytellers because that's exactly what we do um, to tell the stories. So 
anyone listening who wants to know more, please do not hesitate to contact us at any time, and we will tell you as much as we know. <laughs> well, I, I for one, take advantage of that. I, mean, I think it's recorded, so I can call you on it uh, in the future, which is, is great. But Donnery, thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful. Uh, Georgette, Brenda, did, did you want to uh, jump in anywhere here or add anything? Um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, just thinking about, again, for those of us who, who uh, quite frankly, are, are neglectful of the history and, and looking for an opportunity to learn, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking especially about, uh, and, and Georgette, for, forgive me if you had something to, to jump in, I may be going in a different direction, but you'll take it wherever you'd like to. I was thinking about sort of in the aftermath of, of the abolition of slavery in terms of, a, you know, the sort of legal component of it and realizing that just because legislation is passed, as we know, the reality itself doesn't necessarily change and it certainly doesn't necessarily change overnight. And I'm wondering in this, you know, area, sort of whether there is a, a sense or documentation of what the response of the communities that had relied upon and made, again, normalized uh, the usage of slavery to, to function, right, for their businesses, whatever it might be. Was there a violent reaction to it? Was there an angry reaction to it? Was there an acceptance of it? Was there a championing of it? Uh, and my guess is that, of course, the, the, being a student of history, the answer to that is yes, right, that there is some combination of all of those factors. But I'm just curious, sort of in your studies and, in, and what you've done, did you find, uh, you know, that the, the response had a particular tenor or, or a, a feeling to it that you could describe as comprehensive or universal, or was it as varied as, as uh, one might imagine? Well, I will say that's that's one of the things that we always find and we always have to talk about, you know, the differences between terminology and loopholes. Um, it, you know, we always have to discuss this thing between indentured servitude or, or, mm -hmm. or, or, or enslaved. You know, there really is is, is no different. It's, it's a, it, what I say is uh, a nuance or, uh, you know, it's this thing right. where... It, it's how do you describe something? How do you incur a debt that before you're born that you never actually had? Or let me just go back to what Donna Marie was saying mm -hmm. that this is an American story. Um, and the fact that you have to remember Sag Harbor and where we are situated is the first custom house. The fact that Montauk Lighthouse is essentially the first uh, according to some you know, uh, historians, the first uh, lighthouse commissioned by George Washington. Some people will say it's the second, but officially it's the first uh, in the country to have a lighthouse. And why is that? Because you think about the ships that were coming over to Europe, where would they go to register uh, their goods? And then the second thing is there were loopholes. After the law was commissioned after 1827, slavery is abolished. There were such documents that state okay, there's a certain amount of time that if you're not a resident of New York and you come in with your indentured or enslaved persons, all you had to do is leave for a certain amount of time and then you can come back in for that certain amount of time all over again. So there were a lot of loopholes and different things that would allow you to get around it. And there were such documents that say that the last time we really seen any enslaved persons was after the year of 1866 in New York State. Mm -hmm. So it's just like now, you see people, we're not supposed to be driving around with our cell phones on our ear and you still see it. So it always becomes a, a, an issue of enforcement. Mm -hmm. Who and how are we going to enforcement? Mm -hmm. So after what you see is, as soon as the laws happen, people already begin to figure out how do we get around with it? And even after slavery, when we think about the Atlantic slave trade and how the Atlantic slave trade was abolished, nobody talks about the domestic slave trade. Mm. And what about that? So I think that a lot of times when you think about slavery in this country, it is the most, uh, we don't know enough about it as far as teaching it to the general public. So the Atlantic slave trade is pales in comparison to the domestic slave trade. Um, uh, there is so much that we have to do in regards to teaching about slavery. There were so many um, different, uh, the North, you know, we have a friend in common, 
when we think about Katrina Brown and the work that she's done. Her family from right here, Rhode Island in the North was one of the biggest slave traders. Mm -hmm. We have the Wanderer ship that was actually built here in Port Jefferson. It was a, 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 the fastest slave trader boat that went to South Carolina and came back. So there's so much that our relationship here on Long Island that was in relationship to um, the slave trade. Uh, and then uh, Donna Marie was talking about the connection to um, Barbados. We also mm -hmm. have connections to Antigua in the slave trade. Uh, so, you know, there are so many different nuances when it comes to uh, the slave trade that we have as Long Island and we never talk about it. Um, and I think if we talk about it more, we'll understand our relation and not let us not forget that we have William Floyd, a signer of the Declaration of Independence right here. And there are enslaved people buried on the William Floyd estate. Uh, we don't visit, we don't talk about that. So there are many different sites that we have right here on Long Island, many cemeteries on the North Fork, on the South Fork that have documented and which we consider the stones to be a document as well, um, that document the enslavement of um, African Americans here. And uh, also Eastville Historical Society has a collection of archeological finds that we um, actually um, received and inherited from, the, from Stony Brook's old program. So I think we have a lot of documents um, that shows and can prove, um, as well as the library, the Penny Packer um, collection at East Hampton Library. Um, but we have a lot of work to do, and I think the best thing that we can do is try to incorporate um, some literature that can be supported over time, because the MAP program that was previously at Hostra, it's up, but it's not supported much longer. And one of the things that me and Brenda has been working on we have to make teachers feel comfortable, black or white, whatever your creed is, comfortable to teach it because that's what we've been told. You have to be comfortable to teach this information. If you're not comfortable to teach it, it's not gonna be taught. And that's the biggest thing that we see is a problem. We, if we don't teach it, this is why we have a problem. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Brenda, and then I think Donna Marie also wanted to add something as well. Okay. No, no, Brenda, go ahead. You're, you're first. Okay. Yeah. I just want to add something really small. I remember when we were gathering, and I remember something Dave, David said that was really intriguing to me that I think would be more acceptable. We look at slavery sometimes in such a, a different way, but he mentioned about the economic value that they had. Remember you said that, Dave? Remember, remember Dave, you brought that up? <clears throat> If you yes. want to elaborate on that, I, I thought that was something that we should even talk about. Just just for a minute. Well, uh, about individual enslaved people um, and the, uh, their contribution to the economy here. Right. Um, yeah. So what's really clear and maybe an organizing factor is that we all think of America as uh, sort of coming out of the New England colonies, maybe a little bit of Virginia and that these sort of the way we've been told history is that the white colonists sort of worked to build the towns that, you know, became the colonies that became the states that became the United States. And what we've talked about, and I, I think this is what you're getting at, Brenda, is that enslaved and free blacks, as well as enslaved and free native people worked side by side with the white colonists who built the towns that, you know, became the colonies that became the United, that became the states that became the United States. So you can't separate the, the economic value of people of color, usually working in a forced situation, if not outright exploited uh, enslavement, essentially are an inescapable part of the development of the United States, because you can't break apart the economic contribution of a white settler without um, uh, including the, the native people. And it's important to, to realize that there are uh, free blacks here from the beginning as well. There's a, a man, I think it's around 16, uh, 1660s named Peter, who lives near Meacox. There's a man named John in 1676, it's 100 years before the Declaration of Independence, who has, uh, he's a free black man living in East Hampton. And uh, one thing I think that's really interesting about the economic importance of slavery is that essentially every 
householder or farmer of means in colonial New England, southern New England in particular, had one or two enslaved people in their house. This is not a plantation system. This is a very, very widespread system of economic output. And, uh, you know, the records really show that enslaved people and free blacks were part of the the economic fabric of the colonies. And, and um, it really seems to me, and, and one can, you know, uh, tying to the Caribbean in particular, Don Marie's spoken a little bit about, um, slavery is completely inseparable from the development of places like Southold and East Hampton and the New England colonies. In fact, John Winthrop Jr. in 1635 talks about how excited he is to see an economic, in, this is a Massachusetts, uh, one of the Massachusetts real founders, uh, He's excited about an economic opportunity that the West Indies may provide for his colony to sell provisions, uh, particularly wool. Um, you know, I, I think that, that um, the New England colonies really owe their existence to the labor of enslaved people and the, the greater system of, of Atlantic slavery. Yeah. Um, Don Marie, I think you had a hand up before. I don't want to yes, pass okay. the pass over you. That's all right. Um, just to sort of jump on to what everybody else has been saying, um, as Georgette mentioned, this is this is information that is not actually taught in schools, hmm. and uh, teachers and educators need to feel comfortable with it. When visitors come to Sylvester Manor, and I tell stories, uh, inevitably the thing that is is said is, "I didn't know that." I was never taught that. I didn't know there was slavery in New York. I didn't know there was slavery in Long Island. I didn't know there was slavery on the East End. I didn't know that it ended in 1827. Nobody ever taught this to me. And this is said by every kind of generation, uh, uh, white people, black people, young people, old people. Mm. And so that makes the information that we're gathering and trying to share all the more important. Um, I think it's also important for us to say that this, these stories and this history and these facts that there were enslaved people, African people, right here in our towns and villages is not, is not something we should look at with shame or blame. Mm. This is the history. This, mm. uh, these are the people that lived here. Mm. We have gone through centuries of not, of not knowing about them, of not acknowledging them, of not saying their names. Um, either intentionally or just by benign neglect. And so now that we are finding their names and, and finding their histories, this is the time to reinsert them without saying like, well, you know, you were a bad guy and you, you didn't talk about this. Um, there's, the history is so rich and it's, it's so important that we don't have time for guilt and we don't have time for blame or for shame. Um, if you don't know, ask the question. And that's the only way you're going to learn. And that's the only way we're going to move on. If you don't mind, I want to add to that. Um, in the process of going to the Southampton High um, Elementary School, well, Southampton District, to be honest, I was meeting with a young lady who was very, very excited. And she's really going to move forward with this. But it was interesting. She put a hold on it because she felt like the teachers need to be trained because some of them felt uncomfortable talking about slavery. So mm -hmm. I just want to interject that, that, you know, that's another component of it. We want to go forth, we want to be taught, but I'm just telling you through my experience with Southampton that, and I thought it was wise for her to, to acknowledge that. So she must have had some sort of sense that she wanted to make sure that the mm -hmm. teachers were prepared and would do the right thing in teaching the kids about, you know, African-American history. Mm -hmm. I think that um, the, COVID and remote learning presents an opportunity, frankly, because people like yeah. us or, or John, my intern, who made his little five minute film, um, I, I think that with remote learning, it's conceivable that schools um, and parents are really hungry to give their children um, little educational opportunities. And, and I, I think that this may be a moment for those of us who are working in this field or chipping away at the edges to, to reach out to organizations. Um, I think in a way, we it, it's a terrible pun, I, maybe I shouldn't even say it, but you know, we have a captive audience to um, at, at a moment now, and there's fewer distractions. And 
Um, we are super optimistic about bringing uh, the message in that little five minute video to other seventh grade classes uh, on the East End this fall. I think that, I, and I would say even, even tonight is evidence of, of that reality, right? That we had, uh, you know, the largest number of registrations for probably any pro uh, uh, evening of learning that has happened in the six years that I've been a rabbi. I might have to make all of you rabbis to keep, uh, you know, things going at the temple. But in truth, it speaks to, I think, actually, David, what you're talking about. And, and, and I think to some degree also that we are in a state, especially in this country right now, where I hope, right, part of the, the reality is that we have to have our hearts open, right? We have to be looking at everything and, and really looking, I think, with the intention. And I really appreciate each of you have said this in different ways tonight, but the intention really on focusing on education, right, on the idea that what we are today does not define what we will know tomorrow or what we can be tomorrow, right? That, that education is the foundation of every significant social change that has ever happened in history. It starts there. And of course, the real challenge is when that history isn't there, if nobody has done the work that you guys are doing to create the curricula, to help the teachers, to inspire them to do the work, to get them past their own innate challenges about why they, right, the imposter syndrome feeling, right, for example, right, of trying to teach somebody else's history and what does that mean and how to do it, right? These things don't happen by accident. They happen because of dedicated people like yourselves and those that have, have helped all of your each individual organizations and the work that you've done. Uh, and I think it's, it's tremendously important. Um, you know, just being cognizant of, of time because I think I could keep all, all of you, quite frankly, forever and I don't want to do that disrespectful of you or anybody else. Uh, Georgette, I know that you, you have something to jump in and, and, uh, and then I just had, had one additional question and then hopefully we have already a list of, of questions of which we will ask a few of them tonight and everyone yeah. will forgive me if I don't ask yours, but, uh, but Georgette, please. Yeah, I'm, I was looking at some of the questions. That's what I was uh, I'm ah, looking at some of great. them and I'm shaking my head at some of them. Mm. Uh, Cause I, I, I was going to, I'm trying to answer some, I've been answering some, but I, I, <laughs> So, yeah, it's like, you can't you can't answer um, every question. That's that's yeah. Yeah, you know some of them I can I could answer, um, but overall I wanted to say um, I think moving forward I think this is it, it's an open dialogue that we have to continue to keep moving forward in this direction because I think most importantly while this actually a lot of what has happened when. Uh, especially now when we're thinking about Black Lives Matter. Yeah. When you have people that talk about, oh, I don't understand um, mm. systemic isms. Because if, if, if you really go back a few years before what's happened now, you know, I think it was at the Parish Art Museum. And I talked about isms because I don't just say one racism. Because to me, the isms, sexism, all these isms i always say that because they all come back from a whole list of things that you have to deal with mm. um and 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 they're, they're built up on a whole foundation so because it's all it has to do with what we're saying the economic disenfranchisement that has happened over years it's like you know my cousin told me about an issue that she's seen with facebook it's like you're on the monopoly board and people have gone around 401 times and now here it is we're going to go around it and there's nothing left there's nothing left to buy so that's mm. the situation mm. that where we are now and so but how did that happen so mm. how do you make up for this situation where you have to break down and dismantle and to mm. explain what has happened and what has happened is been, you've been disenfranchised to understand. And the fact of the matter is we have to take out and separate the feelings, right? My grandfather used to always tell us, you got to grow a, 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 a thick or a tough skin. You know, it's really mm. not about everyone's feelings because we, when you think about the facts, not everyone had, and, you know, were owned a person. Because you can't own a person and everyone was not fortunate enough to own a person, you know? And, and so not everybody, no, you may have not owned it. You may not directly own someone, but you may have benefited Independent. from the system, oh, the system. system. You may have benefited in some way. Mm. So at the end of the day, this is what you have to think about how you've benefited 
from the system. And that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to think about what this means and how it is connected to slavery. Mm -hmm. And so this is why it's important to have the conversation today and understand how it affects us. Mm. So that's why the story of slavery, you know, wh why didn't we learn this? What is it? It's civics. When did civics education leave the school? In the 1960s. And why? It was purposeful, right? So when we talk about all of this mm -hmm. and how it relates, that's when we go back to understand to never forget, like you said. And I always say, let's borrow that from our Jewish brothers and sisters. Let's never forget the lesson so that we don't repeat it. And we know how many African-American or African diaspora museums do we have? We just got the one in Washington. Right. And what did it take? It take a massive undertaking to have it. Yeah. We really don't have many. And right. the one that we have in Nassau County is a municipal organization that's very tough to maintain. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we need to have and support the institutions that you see here and the programs such as David. We don't have wide support and it takes a lot to support the institutions that you see here. Mm -hmm. We don't have support to do what we need to do to maintain our programs, the research that we're talking about. We don't have the manpower, but as you see, it's very important to do the work that we are doing to get it into the schools, to get it into the right hands of the people. So yeah. if I can leave with one last thing is we need your support and it doesn't have to be financial. I will tell you one of the best things that I ever walk into in the morning is someone who may have found a doll that mm. they think is inappropriate and, I'm, and, and they leave it on my doorstep. If you have these dolls or images or something you don't want mm. that you're cleaning out someone's house, please don't throw it in the river or in the garbage can. We will gladly take your collections because we need that because we show it. Uh, collections, I love when I receive that because we use it as a teaching tool. You know, when you think about these conversations about where these statues or the ancient mamas that no longer has cannibalized teeth, she now has pearls and a permanent hair. If you have that stuff and that collection, we'll take it gladly. So we need all kind of help. We need collections or if you want to come and scan or answer phones, please contact us. May it Thank start tonight. May it start tonight. If my boss and my wife will let me, you can count me in for scanning. I did a lot of work, believe it or not, in my previous job in digital photography for archival purposes. So I'll talk to you guys about that in a, in a separate call. But I think that, that is truly wonderful. And I, and I realize, of course, that all the questions is an indication, again, of, um, of just how much interest there is and how much everyone wants to know more. And realizing, of course, uh, that at the outset, we knew going into tonight, we would not be able to cover it all. I'm just wondering if I can impose upon you just for one last uh, piece, especially as a Sag Harbor native and realizing that I'm the piece that I, I don't know enough about. Could you just briefly tell us a little bit about the, the development of and the history of, of the SANS communities here? Um, and if also, I know, you know, some of the realities of changes of time, of what, um, what challenges may exist today uh, in terms of the preservation of the identity of, of the communities themselves and what, if anything, we can do who are in surrounding of those communities uh, to make sure that we are doing whatever we can to preserve the unique identities, the history, uh, and the narrative. And I realize, again, rabbis, again, ask way too many questions and big ones at that. So answer whatever you feel comfortable <laughs> to answer. But, uh, you know, I, that's what I'll put in the selfish category of I would just love to learn more. Sure. Uh, um, I'll go since I'm the Sands resident. Um, so my parents started coming to Sag Harbor in the early 1950s. And during that time, post-World War II, um, black families were starting to come to the eastern end of Long Island to Sag Harbor. And the areas that are known as Azure S, Sag Harbor Hills, and Nineveh, as well as Chatfield Hills, Lighthouse Lane, um, was land that was available 
um, through developers to African American families. And they would come out to sort of look around or spend a weekend and stay at the Ivy Cottage on Hampton Street, uh, which is connected to Eastville. And they started to build, buy land and build homes. And my parents were among them. I was uh, six months old when I first came to Sac Harbor. And I proudly will say that this is my 65th consecutive summer. Um, I've never spent a summer in the city as a child. It, it just seemed like the most impossible thing anybody could ever ask me to do. Um, and now I live here pretty much full time. Um, the development of the communities um, happened primarily from, as I said, from the early 50s um, through when I was growing up in the 60s and 70s. And for the most part at that time, it was primarily a community of African-American families. Uh, starting, uh, I'd say maybe in the 1980s, some of the original families, uh, the parents, because they were getting older, because the children had gone away to college, Sag Harbor was not so cool to come and spend, you know, your summers on the beach here. Um, the older generation would have started to uh, pass away. The children would inherit the, the, the houses, which were built as small cottages, primarily a simple kitchen, maybe one bathroom, small size bedrooms, just to be very real about it. And as time went on, they could not really accommodate the, the needs of the growing family or, or the aspirations of, of having a larger, more modern kind of house. And there was also then maybe somebody who was going to knock on your door and say, I'll give you a million dollars for your house. And that's a little hard to, to turn down sometimes. Right. And so right. the community did change um, in that it became much more uh, integrated, if you want to say, uh, communities, uh, neighborhoods. And fast forward to today, um, there was an effort to buy up a lot of properties. Uh, out of black families' hands. And so we have come together to work very hard to have our communities recognized as culturally significant uh, in the state of New York and also nationally. And none of it could have happened without Georgette's invaluable assistance. Um, and so now that we are recognized on the National Registry as uh, a culturally important uh, communities. Mm -hmm. And moving forward, it's important for us. We are a diverse community now, um, but it's important to remember how it began and the traditions and the values that we all grew up with of coming here to be together, to being in a safe community of uh, a community of children, of families, of elders sharing, sharing the beautiful summer here in, in San Harbor. We all have these wonderful memories of of growing up here, of being on the beach, of going to the movies uh, in town, of having ice cream at paradise, just like everybody else in town. Uh, mm -hmm. We are Sag Harbor people. <laughs> I love it. I, I can't imagine us ending probably on a, on a more uh, beautiful note. And I, I just want to really thank all four of you for being on tonight, for giving us your your time and your energy and your love. And much more so than just tonight, right? Everything that you have done up to this point and everything I know that you are committed to doing going forward. And I, I hope that this will not be taken as a throwaway line. And I hope you will take it with the seriousness which is offered. It, whatever that I can do personally, just as Dan, and whatever I can do as, as rabbi of the temple, and I think you know the members of our community as well, um, not just to be in, in support of, but, but really again, to, to continue to build this remarkable cohesion and connection that all of you are working so hard to, to create for all of us. Um, whatever we can do, whatever we can do to be supportive and helpful, please do let us know. And I, I can tell you right now, uh, and not to impose myself upon you, but when we have our, our youngins together again in the future, uh, it would be really wonderful to be able to bring you back and, and to do exactly what we've talked about, because I think um, you know, one of the great hopes that I've always had in the darkest of times is that you look and you see children. Um, they haven't yet learned some of the, the cynicism and the, uh, the hard heartedness that many of us as we get older tend to develop in one form or the other. Uh, the potential is there, but they need teachers and they need supporters. Um, and I think really the work that you are doing, as I described it before, uh, in our tradition, the word is kadosh in Hebrew, which means sacred. 
right? This is sacred work. And really from the bottom of my heart, thank you uh, for everything that you do. And if you have any last comments, and again, everybody who asked questions, I apologize that we didn't get to answer them. Uh, but what I can say is the answers to these questions will be found in these wonderful people. And from what they have said, they would love to interact with you. They each have organizations. You can find their information online. If you can't find me and I will help you find them, uh, please take advantage of their generosity of spirit. Um, and the last question that I can't answer quickly is, yes, we have recorded this. Yes, it will be up and online by tomorrow and can be spread uh, as widely as you feel comfortable. Thanks to, again, the, the generosity and the grace of our presenters tonight. Uh, so last words are to you. And really, again, thank you. Thank you so much. I'd just like to say we love working with students. Um, we've worked with several students. We let when this hopefully is over or we can set up a Zoom. We love opening up our collections to let students work with firsthand archival material and research. We think it's vital to their education. So whenever this is over, we would love for them to come in and handle and work. You know, we teach them the procedures because we think it's important to them. Um, so we would love to work with them firsthand and on hand to let them work with uh, materials anytime. That, that is great too, because I got some, some kids I'm sure who would love both the experience and uh, you know to help out. And I can think of already a couple, I, I will be happy to connect you when time comes when you can use some extra hands. Um, you and, know, and, and as I said. And, what we, and we found out that the students actually uh, break less things than the adults, so there's no problem there. <laughs> I also like to plug too, you said to make sure I mention this, that anyone who would like to donate to the South Haven African American Museum, you can send your donation, your donation to tax region donation to PO Box 2263, Southampton, New York, 11963, or you can go to our website, www.samsaammuseum.org. And thank you so much. And that's great. And uh, Donna Marie, was there anything else that you wanted to add in terms of contacting Sylvester Manor, contacting you, no, supporting you? No, you? You can, obviously you can go to our website. Uh, donations are always welcome. Right. Uh, cash, check, or credit card. Um, um, our grounds are open. They are beautiful. Uh, take the ferry ride and come and visit us. Go check it out. And I will just make a pitch, even though I, I, maybe David won't make it for himself or for the press. Please support the local press, please. <laughs> it is very important. It is essential. Uh, David, thank you for everything that you and your family have done to help keep us informed. And uh, really, just God bless you all, and please take care of yourselves. Everybody on the call, please be safe. Wear your masks. Be thoughtful about others. You know, just please think about other people. That, that would be my last message for tonight. Let's, let's all do that, and let's be better. Exactly. I love it. Right, up, right there, right back. Edge. I'm not as good at it as you are. If I had my daughter here, she'd master it, but really. And I look forward to being able to see you all in person. We will, we will celebrate. We will celebrate Absolutely. together when that day comes. Thank really. you again. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank you all again who have attended. We really appreciate your, your attention and, and care tonight as well. Thank Take you. care, everybody. Good night. Bye.